Giuseppe Joe Petrosino was an immigrant who believed in the American dream. He worked his way up the ranks of the NYPD, becoming the first Italian detective on the force. He was even nicknamed the Italian Sherlock Holmes. But at the height of his career, Petrosino went to Italy on a covert mission to bust up organized crime. It would have tragic consequences. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Sal Bono, and this is New York Green. In the late 1800s, Italian immigrants arrived on America's shores in droves. Among those huddled masses yearning to be free was a young Joseph Petrosino, who first set foot here as a 13-year-old. He was someone who, with great ambition, with great integrity. He started out, you know, with a shoeshine business in front as a teenager to make money for his family. He had a shoeshine business in front of the police department headquarters on 300 Mulberry Street in Manhattan. Petrosino then landed a job with the city working in sanitation. Got a job working uh, on garbage scows, which at that time were part of the street cleaning department, which was part of the police department. Caught the eye of a famous inspector who recognized that they needed some police who could speak Italian and brought him into the department, even though he was under the, the size, the size people, cops were supposed to be at that time. But because he was fluent in many Italian dialects, Petrosino aided the police by working undercover as an informer. He joined the police department in 1883. Then police commissioner Theodore Roosevelt personally promoted him to sergeant of detectives in 1895. In those years, things weren't easy for Italian immigrants. What was New York City's attitude toward Italian immigrants at that time? Well, it was extremely negative. Our uh, forebears faced a lot of challenges. In the South, there were, you know, lynchings of Italian immigrants. In those days, people, educated people, professors and so forth, believed that, you know, certain nationalities were inherently inferior or superior. That's the eugenics theory. And I think that rubs off on journalists and judges and prosecutors and, and a lot of people Italian uh, immigrants had to deal with. And they're just different, you know. The Irish came, but they mostly spoke English. No doubt they had their own issues to overcome. And large German migration, you know, they were, how do you put this, light-skinned Northern European people. And the Italians came and they just seemed so so different. What's this food they eat, this tomato pie and, and you know, exotic things like ravioli and lasagna and vegetables they sell in the market. And so there was really a lot of bias against the Italian uh, immigrants. So they were given the worst jobs. They had the worst housing. They lived in tenement housing, very compact, many, many people to a room. They were discriminated against, clearly. And when it came to the police department, the police department was almost entirely Irish. And so that most of them, very, very few of them spoke Italian. They, so they could not communicate with the Italians at all. And they really just kind of let Whatever was happening in Little Italy in the uh, Lower East Side of New York or Manhattan, they just like, you guys figure it out because we, don't, we can't talk to you, we can't help you, and we don't really want to. One of the most terrifying experiences for Italian immigrants came from their own people. It was called the Black Hand. The Black Hand was basically an extortion racket. Black Hand was a kind of umbrella term for individual and usually separate groups of thugs who seized on a very frightening logo, a black hand, put it on blackmail letters in order to extort money from Italian immigrants who achieved some degree of success. It was individuals or small groups of men who were of Italian descent, and they engaged in these back and forth with individuals in which they were trying to, to make money, they're trying to get money. They would send a letter to a business owner and they would say, give us $5,000 or we're going to burn down your business. And they would sign the letters with a little black hand, uh, literally. Usually they were in Italian, sometimes they were in English, but they always were very threatening or a businessman might be defiant and ignore the letter, in which case he ran the risk of their the business being burned down. And this happened. These guys would actually act on it. It was not a bluff. And so it was a very difficult situation for people in the Italian community in New York, for example, because 
they if they were defiant, they ran the risk of you know being hurt or killed or their businesses being ruined. But if they gave money to the, this black hand group, then they typically would ask for more. In other words, if you give them this amount, now they're going to keep asking until you know until you can't give any more. There were people engaging in black hand activities who had associations with the mafia, but they're not the same thing. They're they they are separate things. How come the Black Hand only went after Italian immigrants? Did they ever go after people in power or prosperity in New York City? Well, only if they were Italian, it seems. I think it's very typical of immigrant groups in general uh, to have a uh, one one uh, group of criminals who prey on their own people. That that that's not unique to Italians at all. I think with Italians, it maybe got a little out of hand because it wasn't very well policed, and the Italians were not interested in cooperating with the police very much either. At one point, the Black Hand targeted Enrico Caruso. Enrico Caruso burst on the operatic scene in 1894 on the stage of the Theatre Bellini in his native Naples, Italy. For 27 years, he was to command the spotlight. The Neapolitan tenor would stand alone as the brightest star in the musical firmament. How big of a deal was that at the time? I mean, this is the most world-renowned tenor. It was a big story, no doubt. Uh, it was a national story. So the pressure was really on the police to solve it, as they always are when there's a high-profile crime nowadays, too. The intimidation of the Black Hand can be seen in The Godfather Part Two, when a young Vito Corleone, played by Robert De Niro, is at a play with a friend who accidentally tells a Black Hand leader to sit down in Sicilian. De Niro asks, who is the man? And his friend in Sicilian says, that is the Black Hand. I'm on a knee with in order to combat the crimes of the Black Hand, the NYPD created a task force. Their very first task force called the Italian Squad. The Italian Squad was led by Joe Petrosino here on Lafayette Street, just a few blocks north from where he lived. Directly across the street from police headquarters was the tenement that Joe Petrosino once lived in with his wife and infant child. That was the official name, was the Italian Squad, sometimes called the Italian Bureau of the Police Department. It was designed to crack down on crime in the Italian community, and I think served a particular role in being a bridge to a community that was very uh, isolated from the police department. The Italian squad worked in secret. They would come to work and they would dress in workmen's clothes and then go out to workmen's jobs. And they were working undercover to try to find out what was going on to find these black handers. Undercover work was an innovation, informants was an innovation. And then one of the things that was happening, of course, is when people weren't paying these, these uh, uh, extortion uh, demands, then their buildings got blown up. It was Petrosino who created the bomb squad for NYPD, the first ever bomb squad in America. And today it's still operating, obviously. And so he was really involved, he and his team were involved in learning about the techniques of and how to investigate, you know, bombings. Was their main goal to try and bring down the Black Hand? Yeah, Black Hand crime was was what they wanted to end. They knew that there was not a, a single entity called the Black Hand. There were certain groups that were more powerful. Tresino's nickname would be the Italian Sherlock Holmes. It wasn't a secret that they existed, that wasn't a secret that they were around. Did that put more of a target on the Italian squad's back, given their popularity, and especially the fact that they were extending an olive branch to a community which generally doesn't hold a lot of trust for authority. You know, Southern Italians were really very much uh, an oppressed people after the unification of Italy, sad to say, and that's why so many came, came here. Um, but uh, yes, one of the biggest problems that the uh, squad had was that it's detectives were very recognizable. Eventually, I think with Petrosino, no, no amount of disguise was going to uh, cover up who, who he was. As Petrosino's name appeared in the newspaper more and more, he became a target, that it, he was putting himself and his work was putting himself in a, in a difficult position because it would not be surprising if someone wanted to retaliate against him. Almost all the black handers that they had arrested or that they had convicted had criminal records back in Italy. If you could know that these guys had criminal records when they stepped up to Ellis Island or whatever, then you could send them home. You could prevent them from coming in. 
Petrosino's not-so-secret mission took him to Palermo, Sicily. The island has had a volatile history for centuries. Palermo stands at the crossroads of the Mediterranean, a Phoenician colony, a Carthaginian town, a link in the chain of the Roman Empire. As word got out that the world's most famous living detective was in Sicily, some of Palermo's underworld got ideas. He had been warned before he went by multiple people that this was a very dangerous mission, that he was known worldwide, and certainly he was known in Italian criminal circle. This was very dangerous for him to go to Italy and operate this way. And he decided to go by himself, which is odd as well. Petrosino's decision to proceed on his mission would have tragic results. One evening, he eats dinner in a restaurant in Palermo. As he walks out of the restaurant into the piazza, uh, he is shot multiple times and killed. Petrosino was 48 years old. He was survived by his wife and infant daughter, but he was mourned widely. Over 200,000 people tried to pack in the St. Patrick's Cathedral for his funeral, but all of the mourners walked in a procession from Manhattan to his grave in Queens, New York. His death is the only murder in NYPD history to have occurred overseas. He remains the only active NYPD officer to have ever been killed overseas. Despite his high-profile murder, it has never officially been solved. It's officially an unsolved crime. Italian authorities did make arrests, indictments, and all that stuff, and then a fellow who had been sent to Palermo to clean up Palermo, the Italian police, was removed. So uh, the case kind of died after that. Following Petrosino's death, how did the Italian squad continue, and how did they have the vision to go on without their humble leader? Well, the man who really picked up the ball was uh, Lieutenant Anthony Vacris. He actually went to Italy to complete the mission on which uh, Petrosino was murdered. The problem that Vacris had was it, amazing to me, but it kind of lost political sponsorship, I guess. Right. Both with the police department and in city government. Within a year after Petrosino died, it's this this enormous hero. The whole city is mourning him. And, Tens of thousands of people turn out for his funeral. You know, we put saints up on pedestals, but we ignore them. That's what happened. The, the Italian squad was getting short shrift, cut back, and ultimately canceled on and off uh, through 1922 when it when it when it when it ended. Um, so that the squad ran into a lot of political difficulty, just when they really needed, because that's when you have prohibition and this buildup of, of uh, organized crime in the city, including Italian organized crime, uh, because they're, they're making so much money off the liquor industry. The legacy of the Italian squad can be seen not just in New York, but across the country. What Joe Petrosino and his men did was lay down the foundation that would help shape law enforcement forever. In 1987, New York City named a special part of Soho near Little Italy after the man. Joe Petrosino Square is near the former police headquarters and where Petrosino lived and worked. Despite his high accolades and game-changing ideas he brought to law enforcement, Petrosino is seldom spoken of. His great-grandnephew, who bears his name, tells me that was even the case in his own family. Joe Petrosino is my great-granduncle. He was uh, a, bro a brother to my grandfather. What was it like growing up and hearing the tales of who this man was? Well, to tell you the truth, there weren't a lot of tales when I was growing up. Um, it was pretty, um, pretty quiet in the house about him. Um, occasionally, when I was very young, my grandmother would say something about him. And uh, one of my neighbors um, said to me once that uh, I had, hadn't heard about him at all. And I guess I was about eight or nine years old. And one of my neighbors said to me, you're Italian royalty. So I said, what the heck is she saying, Italian royalty? So I went, <laughs> I went home and I said to, to my mother, I said, Mrs. Marcucci told me I'm Italian royalty. She goes, because you're related to Joe Petrosino. That's your namesake. And I said, well, who is he? And he says, he was this famous detective. And um, he was killed, you know, over in Italy, in Sicily. And I said, that's the first I really uh, got a grasp of who he was. In the neighborhood, there was never any mention of him. People didn't know who he was. My nephew told me once, he says, you know, Joseph Petrosino is the, one of the most famous people nobody ever heard of. You know, and that's a, that's a good description of what he is because 
most people have never heard of him. And it's also a bit shocking for me to hear that he wasn't really spoken about that much in your family. Was, was it almost like it was too difficult for people to talk about? Do you think that was the case? Like, what, what do you think the reason was? It's partly true. Um, I think because, you know, he was assassinated and all that they, they didn't want to bring it up. And um, I know that um, Adelina, Joe Petrosino's daughter, uh, Susan Burke, his granddaughter, uh, told me that Adelina didn't want to, um, to hear any Joe Petrosino stories in the house. She just didn't want to talk about it. So I think there was, you know, some some uh, lagging hurt there or something, but she just really didn't want to talk about it. Petrosino's life and career have been enshrined in a museum in his hometown of Padula, Italy, as well as in movies like 1960's Pay Me or Die, which starred Ernest Borgnine as Petrosino. But why do you have to defend Lupo? Someone has to jump. Why an Italian? Rotten scum like this. Only makes us look bad, worse than bad. And Petrosino's legacy is carried forward by his family in another way. You decided as a profession, you became a prosecutor. After you learned about who Joe was, did that have any influence on your decision-making to want to become a prosecutor? Well, I think it did. Actually, I wanted to become a, uh, a policeman. I suffered an injury, a severe concussion. I lost the sight in my right eye. So that ruled out uh, them being a police officer. Uh, so I uh, went to college law school and uh, decided to be a prosecutor. I went figure, well, that's close enough. So how do you feel that your son is now with the NYPD? How does it make you feel that to be carrying on these huge shoes to fill, but also he's doing it in his own right? Yeah, he's an intelligence. He's, he's, uh, he does, you know, good work. And um, I'm extraordinarily proud of him you know, what he does. Petrosino's legacy is also on display at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. So the Mob Museum is a, a museum dedicated to telling the story of organized crime in America and also how law enforcement responded to organized crime in America. So it's a very balanced story that we tell. It's both a history museum because we're certainly dealing with 125 years of, of history but it also, we, we also focus on contemporary criminal justice matters. So we look at uh, policing today, we look at organized crime today in all its forms, you know, from uh, the Mexican drug cartels to cyber crime. We are not interested in glorifying mobsters. We are interested in telling their story, which we think is something that is important. I think the Petrosino story really sets the tone for the museum in this way. We're seeing this story about the Black Hand and the early, earliest stages of the Mafia in America through the lens of Petrosino, through the lens of law enforcement at this time in America. And we, it helps us to balance that story right away and point out that, you know, organized crime, people are bad. Uh, we are not glorifying them. We do not think they're good people. As for the Black Hand, Many of those were sent to trial and convicted in the famous Black Hand trials of the early 1910s. With the outbreak of World War I in 1914 and then Prohibition, the Black Hand began to weaken. Why don't you think his story is told more? I think it's because he is Italian-American. You look at a guy like Elliot Ness who, you know, he got Al Capone, but that's basically all. He's, he's been celebrated in his name. If you say Elliot Ness to somebody, they, they know who he was, you know, what he did. Yeah, and Joe Petrosino did, you know, to my mind, so much more. He's a guy who was, you know, laying in hallways, defusing bombs, you know, so people wouldn't blow up. I mean, that's why he got the name as the, you know, creator of the bomb squad, because he's the first one to go and, and defuse these bombs. But there's, there's no little recognition of that. I mean, he went undercover, you know, with anarchists and discovered, you know, a plot against the president. I mean, he did a lot of uh, astounding things. And, um, you know, but, but people don't really uh, get into that for some reason. I don't, I don't know why. I think a Petrosino story is, is, is important because it tells another version of the Italian immigration story to America. More often than not in the movies and, and in TV, when you're talking about Italian Americans, you're telling mafia stories. And 
while those things are real, they are things that, you know, happened. And we tell those stories in the museum. This is an opportunity for us to tell the other side of that story and, and note that really the overwhelming majority, 98% of Italian immigrants to America, maybe 99% were law-abiding, were hardworking, were hoping that whatever advantages they could gain for their families would lead to the next generation doing better, going to college, getting professional jobs, moving on from this, this really difficult situation in which immigrants found themselves when they first came here. Petrosino is part of that story. In theory, you know, Petrosino could have been a little looser with his morals and he could have gone the mafia route. He probably would have been a really good enforcer for the mafia. He was super tough, you know, and fearless and all of that stuff. But fortunately, he took the other route and became tough and fearless and smart on the side of the law. And uh, there were many others like him.